Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Mountain View Church of Christ. We are glad that you have joined us today in worship, to worship with the Lord, together in fellowship with one another. Make yourself right at home, and let's celebrate the Lord's Day. Today I want to start with Isaiah 11.6. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. I want to tell you a story. Jeremy was born with a twisted body and a slow mind. At the age of 12, he was still in the second grade. Seemingly unable to learn, his teacher, Doris Miller, often became frustrated with him. He would squirm in his seat and make grunting noises. At other times, he spoke clearly and distinctly just as if a spot of light had penetrated the darkness of his brain. But most of the time, however, Jeremy just irritated his teacher. One day, she called his parents and asked them to come in for a conference. As the foresters entered the empty classroom, Doris said to them, Jeremy really belongs in a special school. Is it, it isn't fair to him to be with all these younger children who don't have learning problems. There is a five-year gap between his age and those of the other students. Miss Foster cried softly into a tissue while her husband spoke. Miss Miller, he said, there is no school of that kind nearby. It would be a terrible shock for Jeremy if we had to take him out of this school. We know he really likes it here. Doris, the teacher, sat for a long time after they had left, staring out into the snow outside the windows. Its coldness seemed to seep into her soul. She really wanted to sympathize with the foresters. After all, their only child had terminal issues. But it wasn't fair to keep him in class. She had 18 other children to teach. And Jeremy was a distraction to her class. Furthermore, he would never learn to read and write. Why should she waste any more time trying? As she pondered the situation, guilt washed over her. Here I am complaining with my problems when my problems are nothing compared to that poor family, she thought. Lord, please help me be more patient with Jeremy, she prayed. And from that day on, she tried hard to ignore Jeremy's blank stares. Then one day, he went to her desk, dragging his bad leg behind him. I love you, Miss Miller, he exclaimed loud enough for the whole class to hear. The other students sniggered. Doris's face turned red. She stammered. Said, well, Jeremy, that, that's very nice. Now, now please take your seat. Spring came, and the children talked excitedly about the coming of Easter. Doris told them the story of Jesus. And then to emphasize the idea of life springing forth. She gave each child a large plastic empty Easter egg. Now, she said to them, I want you to take this home and bring it back tomorrow with something inside that shows new life. Does everyone understand this? Yes, Miss Miller, all the children responded enthusiastically, all except for Jeremy. He listened intently his eyes never left her face. He did not even make his usual noises. Did he understand the assignment? Perhaps she should call up his parents and explain the project to them. That evening, Doris's kitchen sink stopped up. She called the landlord and waited an hour, waited for hours for him to come by and unclog it. After that, she still had to prepare for the vocabulary test the next day. She completely forgot about phoning 
Jeremy's parents. The next morning, 19 children came to school, laughing and talking as they placed their Easter eggs in the large basket on Miss Miller's desk. After they completed their math lesson, it was time to open the now-filled empty, uh, empty eggs. In the first egg, Doris found a flower. Oh yes, a flower is certainly a sign of new life, she said. When plants peek through the ground, we know spring is here. A small girl in the first row waved her arm. That's my egg, Miss Miller, she called out. The next eggshell contained a plastic butterfly, which looked very real. Doris held it up and said, we all know that a caterpillar changes and grows into a beautiful butterfly. Yes, that's new life too. And little Judy smiled proudly and said, Miss Miller, that was mine. Next, Doris found a rock with moss on it. She explained that moss, too, showed life. Billy spoke up from the back of the classroom and said, My daddy helped me. He beamed with excitement. Then Doris opened the fourth egg. She gasped. The egg was empty. Surely it must be Jeremy's, she thought. And of course, he did not understand her instructions. If only she hadn't forgotten to phone his parents. Because she did not want to embarrass Jeremy, she quietly set the egg aside and reached for another. Suddenly, Jeremy spoke up, said, Miss Miller, aren't you going to talk about my Easter egg? Frustrated, Doris said, but Jeremy, your Easter egg is empty. He looked into her eyes and said softly, yes, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. Time stood still. When, you, when she could speak again, Doris asked him, Do you know why the tomb was empty? Oh, yes, ma'am. Jesus was killed and put in there. Then his father raised him up, and that's how Easter got started. The recess bell rang. While the children excitedly ran out to the schoolyard, schoolyard Doris sat and cried. The cold inside her melted completely away. Three months later, Jeremy passed away. Those who paid their respects at the mortuary were surprised to see 19 empty Easter eggs on top of his casket. And we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, We thank you that the tomb is empty. We thank you, Father, that an empty tomb means life for us. We thank you that as we have stumbled around in darkness over these last few months, and we've borne our griefs and our sorrows. Those days of darkness have come to an end now because the light of Christ's resurrection shines into our lives and illuminates every corner of darkness and banishes it forever. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead Thank you, Father, that you empowered him to do so. And thank you for extending to us the life that he gained in that moment, eternal life, never to die again. And you share that with us. We thank you, Father, that we can gather here this morning and praise you for the empty tomb and for the meaning that you have poured into our empty lives. Thank you, Jesus. And may our hearts overflow with the joy that is ours today because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. We're going to do that one more.
more time because that was good and the best response I've ever had in nearly a decade of preaching. That's the best response I've ever had. So I think we can improve it just a little bit more. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Beautiful. Let's stand as we sing, if you're physically able, our first song, Because He Lives. Page number four in your bulletin, Because He Lives. I thought, 
Number one, there's a church that still has a parsonage. You don't see that very often. Number two, there's a cemetery right behind the parsonage. I don't know if I'd like to look out in my backyard and see a cemetery. But, as the Lord connected us with this church and we started to take walks around the cemetery, I grew up going to family funerals and there was always an element of joy when you could get together, you, you celebrate the life of the one you've lost, but you're doing it with family. Then you go to the cemetery and it is a moment of respect, but there's something deep and meaningful about a cemetery when you realize the lives represented, the stories told. But I can tell you there are no souls. I said this this morning, there are no souls in the cemetery behind this church. Those are the rental houses the people use, the bodies they lived in while they were here on earth, and the same will be true for us when it's our time to go. You're saying, Mike, that's a little gruesome for Sunday morning. I'd encourage you to remember it's Resurrection Sunday, and this is the truth of God's Word, that this life we see isn't all there is to it. And it's only because of the blood of Jesus we get to celebrate this. And, and now we, we come to the point in our time of worship where we're preparing for communion. We have little individual communion cups. We're going to have a communion devotion and prayer here in a minute. And then after the devotion and prayer are done during that music, you just take communion uh, as an act of worship between you and God. Right? You just take it as an act of worship between you and God. But to prepare our hearts for that too... Take the clocks and calendars and stresses off our mind. Let's sing one more song. Uh, page 6 in your bulletin, page 6, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We'll sing all four verses. You can remain seated.
Over the past several months, we've all heard too many references to 2020. Some good, some bad. Even Mike has preached on 2020 vision. It's brought us a clearer understanding of a Christian outlook. This morning, I want to look at the term hindsight is 2020. As I read today from Matthew 26, verses 17 through 30, New International Version, I ask that you let you that you let your mind put you in the place of the disciples. Understanding their confusion simply because they didn't have the benefit of hindsight. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell them, tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, you have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This morning, I want us to pay particular attention to verse 28. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Did the disciples understand that? Did they understand what he was saying? He had told them. We see here that he had told them. He had explained it all. But you see, they didn't know something that we did. They didn't have the hindsight that we do now. They didn't know that he was risen from the dead. They knew not of his victory over sin. But today, we have the knowledge to know what Jesus is talking about. Because today, on Easter, as we celebrate his resurrection and his victory over after his death on the cross, his love and sacrifice for each and every one of us on the cross. Quite simply, is why this opportunity to meet here around his table is so important to us as Christians. 
He instilled this time that we may come together as Christians to have the hindsight to reflect on where we have fallen short to ask for His forgiveness as we commune around this, His table. Now, as Mike said, this is His table. We have the cups, the top, there is a clear package on top, and as you peel it back is the loaf that represents Jesus' body. The second half is what represent or what opens the juice. It is Jesus that invites. It's not our place to invite or to bar. It is a decision that you make between you and the Lord. So as we prepare our hearts, let us pray. Come. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning in remembrance of your Son, who gave his life on the cross for us, we take the time to reflect on our own lives, to think about the good times, to think about the things we have repented for and maybe have not. So we take this time to clear our minds, to get straight with the Lord, so that when we do this in remembrance of His Son, we do it with a clean heart and a clean conscience out of our love, our respect, and our gratefulness for all that he does for us every day. We do this in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. to the time of our service for our offering, we'd just like to remind everybody we can still continue not to pass the offering plate. So the basket in the rear of the sanctuary can be used at any time uh, this morning for your tithes and for your offerings. Uh, I'd like to share a missions minute with you this morning uh, that is really a, a good example of where those tithes and offerings go. Mountain View Church has, has supported uh, Smoky Mountain Christian Camp for a long time. Last year, the, the camp 
uh, brought an urgent project need uh, to everyone's attention with the lake and, and their uh, spillway being old and rusted metal and need repair. Uh, this church sent Mike Jones and Brady Boone on a, on a hike-a-thon to, to, to raise funds for that project, and we sent over $1,500 to that effort. A lot of that work took place this winter. Uh, through the month of February, a lot of the repair work uh, to replace that spillway was done. I was a little concerned that we wouldn't get enough rain to fill the lake back up for camp season. And the Lord saw to it that we got about eight inches of rain in the month of March. So uh, the lake is completely full and at times it's been a little over full. But that project's been completed. And if you've ever been to camp uh, on a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening as the camp week wraps up uh, and they've got kids out there uh, and you get to see uh, baptisms uh, at the end of the camp week and decisions that are made for Christ, it's pretty incredible and it's pretty special uh, to get to see that happen. Uh, it's a, a really big event. And uh, getting that project uh, done by the camp is really important. Folks, I'll tell you, I, I don't know, you know that, that we'll all ever get that opportunity to, uh, to baptize someone or to bring someone into Christ. But through our missions work, uh, through our offerings, we're able to participate in that exact process that takes place at the camp. And so that's a pretty incredible thing. So at this time, let's have a, a prayer uh, to bless the offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, ability that we have to work and to support our families and to uh, to do the things that you would have us to do. Uh, and Father, we just ask now your blessing on these tithes and on these offerings. We pray that they can be used to grow your kingdom in this place here at Mountain View uh, in East Tennessee and all around the world. We just know that you can take a little and turn it into a lot. Uh, Father, we just pray that both the gift and the giver would be blessed in these offerings and that it could accomplish things that we could only imagine of. And we thank you for all these things in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now before we get dismissed to junior church, uh, Mike's banjo is here. And Chuck even has his mandolin is here. And Jackson has his guitar. So the guys are going to come up and we're going to set up and we're going to do a special song. Move over here. Um, and Mike, if you would, maybe just as we look for a song to play for, for Easter, I think this message is one that, that tells the story, right? I don't know about you, but I just get excited when the banjo comes out. <laughs> well, you get more excited than most folks did in Kansas. So. <laughs> they just got nervous out there. Maybe it's in Tennessee. Maybe it is. I'm okay with that. Uh, was I keeping this microphone on for this? Don't turn your headset on. Okay. Let's get this one here, Jackson. That is yours. If you got your chuck, you want to share that one over there.
Downstairs. Uh, and Brian, if you don't mind, let's leave one accessible. I've got a schedule. We can shorten that a little something. Last minute. I know that's a big shot. Something last minute, right? right. Everybody knows my phrase. We're going to do something different this morning. All right. You guys are so patient with me when I switch things up. You guys are just great. You're great. We do have several visitors this morning. Uh, who are cooperating much better than my microphone wire right now. That's good. Well, that's what I did. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. I am glad you're here on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. What an honor to be gathering any day of the week, any time of the year. But there's something special about remembering the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, for those who've uh, been coming here for the past month, I've taken us through each of the four Gospels and their unique path to the resurrection intersection, how they each emphasize something a little bit unique. Matthew emphasized authority, Mark emphasized humanity, Luke emphasized historicity, and John emphasized the spirituality of the story. Well, and I'm going to ask you a very personal question this morning. What is your resurrection intersection? How did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior? We're going to be in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 19. Would you mind, out of respect for the reading of the Word this morning, would you please stand with me as I read? The Word will be up on the screen and in your bulletin as well. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. But He did not raise Him if in fact the dead are not raised. Verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Verse 19, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pity. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we, we pray to you right now for your wisdom. I pray that all of us discern your word well. Lord, I've spent time 
preparing, not just during the last week, but nearly a lifetime of becoming familiar with your word and the, the history behind it and, the, and understanding the culture into which it was written. But Lord, none of that preparation matters at all if you're not in it. So I pray right now, make it clear to me, continue to make it clear to me what needs to be said. And make it clear to everyone here what you are trying to say in spite of me being up here. We need to hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here in a minute, uh, uh, David and Rebecca are going to come up in a minute and they're going to read the resurrection account. All right, We're still going to do that this morning. But I, I do want to emphasize... Uh, the, the impact of the resurrection. We're celebrating the resurrection, and we did that together at the sunrise service, uh, where we just focused on that moment of reality that He is risen, right? Well, we need to also think ahead now, because we're going to have this wonderful Sunday time together, and then we're going to get back in our cars, we're going to check our calendars and our clocks and start jumping back into what's next. That's just how it goes. And we need to look at what the resurrection means on Monday. That's a very fair question. So, to each and every one of you here, if you know Christ as Savior, then this is an important topic to you because we are followers of Christ, so we are expected to copy and paste what He does into our lives. So what's the implications of the resurrection? Is the res resurrection just about when we die and being transitioned into heaven and how does that all work or is there something about the power of the resurrection that actually impacts the bravery and the courage with which we face life during the week do you see where I'm going with this now we don't have to go very far in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 you know the Apostle Paul set up this question is our faith in vain but what I, what I like about it is he's going to answer it, all right? He's going to make it very clear that Christ did raise from the dead, right? If, if you have your own Bible, perhaps you're, you're following along with this and you read down just one more verse after this kind of hypothetical question almost, just if and if and if, and I don't want to leave you with any doubts this morning, so let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. That's the good news this morning. Paul only ran the uh, hypotheticals in this because some people were asking questions in the early church and there's nothing wrong with asking questions. And Paul isn't trying to tell us this morning, he's not trying to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. He is talking about us. What resurrection looks like for us. What are the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. What does that mean? Prototype. Prototype. Jesus was the first in a long line of those of us to be raised from the dead. He's a prototype. I was always told I was uh, the prototype because I was the firstborn. My mom often apologized to me for being her guinea pig. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure there's some stories in there somewhere. I do know I was dropped from a car seat onto a hardwood floor at a church where my dad was preaching up in Kentucky. Loud enough, everybody stopped. So if you wonder what my problems are, that are those are my problems right there. <laughs> what does resurrection mean for us? Well, before we get too much further into that, that uh, Rebecca and David, why don't you two come up? I got the Bibles here, and um, I'll hold the microphone for you. I'm going to go ahead and shut mine off. And uh, you guys are going to read the resurrection account. So like I told you, you'll, uh, you'll start off there, hold that, and you'll... Read the, the one that's highlighted uh, first there. And then uh, that, that'll be your color for this passage. And then David, uh, when she's done reading that, then you'll read the ones highlighted there. And she'll read, and then you'll read one more time. You got that? Okay, let me hold the microphone and shut mine off so we don't end up with a feedback situation. Is that Bible heavy, man? Is that a heavy Bible? No. <laughs> okay, uh, do you want to go and take your mask off? Okay, go ahead. Now after the Sabbath, Sabbath after, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and 
thrown to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were light as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who, had been, who has been crucified. He is, not, he is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Good job. Thank you. It's easy for me when I read that to leave that story back in time. You know what I'm saying? 2,000 years ago, this was a wonderful event, praise God. And then uh, to forget that there are implications to that story. What was the first implication of that story uh, according to Jesus? He said, you've met me, now go do what? Oh, I'm going to have him read it again. <laughs> go tell others. That's what we see in when you compare all the gospel accounts, one of the first implications of the resurrection is that we go tell other people about the resurrection. That's one reason we use that traditional resurrection greeting where we say, He is risen, and you respond, He is risen indeed. You're all agreeing with me that we serve a risen Savior. First Corinthians chapter 15, before we got to our passage where Paul talks about the importance of the resurrection, he shares what he shares as the gospel, the gospel that saves. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's one sentence, that's one thought in the Greek. That's one thought. They don't divide any of that. It's all one gospel here. I'm going to say that again. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And even in the rest of that gospel message, He'll also talk about the appearances of Jesus Christ after He raised from the dead as a part of His gospel. But He will talk about this resurrection the belief in resurrection is essential to Christianity. You can't cherry pick that. You cannot believe, say that you are a Christian and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus, not to mention our resurrection in Jesus. If you cherry pick between that, you no longer have Christianity. You've got some special hybrid of your own. If you want to start a cult based on that, I'm sure there's land for sale around here. But that's not what the Bible teaches, so you can't call it Christianity. I'm only, I'm only aggressively highlighting that because Paul aggressively highlights it in the Word of God. And it's, it's important to me in a time like this because we're coming out of a season where there's been a lot of death. Not just in the world, but even here in this church. There's been a lot of loss. There's been a lot of sickness. And if you can't encounter sickness and death with resurrection power, you have no hope. It's already hard enough. Even with Jesus, it's still hard. Jesus doesn't say, I'll take away all your burdens. What does he say? He said, give me your burden. And he said, I will make your load what? That's right. I'll make it manageable. He doesn't say, I'm going to take away all of your worries. He said, cast them on me. And he said, I will make it manageable for you. I'm going to make it manageable. Can you imagine how unmanageable grief must be for those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior? For those who encounter death without resurrection power, without hope. And we're told we grieve. We still grieve, church. But what are we told? We grieve, but not what? Not like the rest of the world. We grieve with what? Hope. We grieve with hope. 
William Sangster, the great Methodist leader who helped guide Londoners through the horrors of World War II bombings, fell ill with a progressive disease that started to paralyze his body, including his vocal cords. On an Easter Sunday just before he died, he managed to scribble the short note to his daughter. How terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice to shout, He is risen. Far worse to have a voice and not want to shout. How terrible not to be able to shout he has risen, but how much more terrible to have the ability and yet not do it because you don't celebrate it. We are surrounded by people in our neighborhoods that don't have reason to shout he has risen because they've never met him. And to some people, he is still on a cross. He's never overcome death. He simply died for us. But let me tell you what. If some crazy guy named Jesus died for my sins but didn't raise from the dead, it was all a circus act. I'm sorry if that offends you. The doors are open. There's other churches out there. That's the truth, though. That's the truth. It's the painful truth. It's the painful truth that... If Jesus just died for our sins, but he had no power to actually overcome the grave, then he wasn't the perfect sacrificial lamb because he wasn't God. But praise God, on Easter Sunday, we are gathering to remember that he has risen, and you agreed with me when you said he has risen indeed. Christ's resurrection establishes credibility for our faith. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised in our passage... If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we then found to be false witnesses about God, for we testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead, but He did not raise Him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. In other words, in other words, Jesus is not 50% God and 50% human. He is 100% God. At 100% human, he has been afflicted in the ways that we've been afflicted. He also joins in the promises that we've been promised, including resurrection. That's for us. If we didn't have the hope of resurrection before Jesus came to earth, he wouldn't have been resurrected. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? You can't pick and choose what you like here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. If there's one thought, if there's one thought we share this morning, I see we're coming in hot on 11 o'clock here. <laughs> if there's one thought, it's that Christ's resurrection guarantees the resurrection of His siblings. Christ's resurrection guarantees our resurrection as his brothers and sisters. What an honor. What a privilege. His resurrection guarantees that for us. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister. Do you remember that? you remember that story where Jesus is speaking and some people came in acting like security guards and they're like, uh, Jesus, you got some uh, people, very important people that want to meet you over here. It's your mothers and brothers and sister. You know, they're all, they're all hanging out. you got family over here. And Jesus is in the middle of teaching. He said, you know what? Here's the deal. You see these people that are listening to me, doing the will of my Father? He said, these are my brothers and sisters. Get lost. He didn't say that. He didn't say get lost. That's... Sometimes he must have felt like saying that to his disciples. Because we get possessive about this gospel. But this gospel from the very beginning, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus, is not designed for us to hold in like a pond. It's designed for us to broadcast and communicate. Let's get the word out there this Easter Sunday. Let's get the word out every day. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, as we draw to a close, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Share in His suffering so that we may also share in His glory. What's that glory? It's the glory that His resurrection guarantees our resurrection. I can tell you right now, to answer Paul's question in the passage, if we have no resurrection, then Christ would have no resurrection, then we have no hope, and is that the way it is? And I would say no. It's not the way it is. I, I see in the Gospels, I see in the Bible an account of Jesus of Nazareth who did not begin in Bethlehem, 
and didn't end at Calvary. Does that make sense? Father, Son, Spirit, He was, and then He came down to earth in our form, walked among us, lived a perfect life so that He could be the perfect sacrifice and have His blood spilled, sacrifice for us to cover our sins, and then, and on top of it, just to prove He could, defeat everything, He defeated sin, and then He defeated death. And why did He wait? Well, that, that's when the body, just to, just to be uh, uh, gruesome for a minute, that's when the body really starts decomposing. That's when you know someone's dead. Why did he wait? Because there had to be proof of death so that there could be proof of resurrection. Country music artist Chris Stapleton has a popular song on the radio. I've liked it for a while called Starting Over. I hear the message of redemption in this song. I find myself uh, humming it to myself when I'm, when I'm driving or, or outside just walking around. Here's the lyrics. This might not be an easy time, there's rivers to cross and hills to climb. Some days we might fall apart and some nights might feel cold and dark. But nobody wins afraid of losing. And the hard roads are the ones worth choosing. Some way, someday we'll look back and smile and know it was worth every mile. And it reminds me of another song called It Will Be Worth It All. Here's the lyrics. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we remember our resurrection intersection when we came to know You and the power of Your resurrection through the blood of Christ. We tasted of ourselves that You are good, that You are powerful, that in You are the words of life. Lord, the message is simple and short this morning. You are risen. You are risen indeed, and we're going to go tell other people. We are going to soak in that truth for ourselves and re-accept that fact that You've overcome sin, sickness, and death. And then, Lord, we are going to take that love and that goodness that you've given to us, and as it brims over, we're going to pour it into other lives. I thank you for everyone here this morning, people who are not able to be here, who will listen uh, online or on a CD. Lord, I thank you for everyone, and I pray a blessing on those who've been a part of this worship service and listen to the message, Lord. I pray your word continues to change our hearts. Thank you for the work you've done through the cross, and through the grave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We do have a hymn of invitation this morning. It'll be on page 5 in your bulletins. Rock of Ages, it'll be page 5. We'll, we'll sing all three verses. And this is a moment for you to come forward. It's also a moment for you to meditate. Invitation or meditation. Whatever God is speaking to your heart, it's time to absorb it before we just leave, right? Isn't that what we tend to do? I know I do sometimes. On to the next thing. Let's, let's meditate on the goodness of God being our rock of ages. He's there for us, and, and it's His blood that cleanses us. Let's sing all three verses. Would you mind standing with me as we sing our final hymn? If you're physically able, as we sing our final hymn.
This morning, people online are going to get a little something different. We're going to talk about a few announcements here. A few things that uh, I tell you what I'm just real excited about. Number one, for for those of you who don't know, we had an Easter egg hunt here yesterday. Almost 1,500 eggs were found. Okay, they were full, and uh, I think they were uh, they they had a great time. There was 36 people here. 17 kids, so uh, something exciting. It was kind of put on at the last minute, but uh, to all those that had a hand in it, thank you very much. We appreciate your your help and your eagerness. Uh, so it's just kind of putting some great things together and plans for next year as we're getting uh, getting restarted here. Also, we had, uh, as Mike spoke of earlier, uh, we had uh, Easter sunrise service and uh, breakfast. There was 35 here this morning. Uh, so it was great to have that. As I told George, it was hard to get two years worth of breakfast in this morning, but I managed. <laughs> but uh, all that being said, we had a great time, and thank you for everybody that uh, participated this morning. Uh, also, next week, uh, it's, it's a very important service to me, and I think a uh, very important uh, service for this church. Next week will be the ordination service for Brian and myself. Uh, please be in prayer for us and for the church as, uh, as we begin our new journey as elders of this church, uh, joining Con. Uh, and also, join us each morning at 7 o'clock. If you're not up at 7, whenever you get up or when you have time, pray for the church. I see things happening, and I, I cannot help but think that it is because of the prayers that are going up or Mountain View Church of Christ by everybody involved. Please continue those prayers. You know, God hears every single prayer. I can't help but think when there's a bunch of us talking at the same time and we're all of one mind that it's almost like we're shouting saying, hey, you know, we're praying for this church. So, you know, i got to say, everybody join in and uh, please be excited about it. I see good things happening and it can only get better as long as we keep God to the center of it. Uh, as far as other uh, items, if you uh, if you do miss a service, uh, you can catch us online on YouTube, or uh, you can also uh, go to our website, and there's a link there. Uh, I don't think I've missed any other... Uh, oh, Smoking Up Camp. Uh, Brian spoke a little bit about camp, but it, camp season is gearing up, and camp season... Uh, is is starting to be registered up. So we have the registrations in the back, so feel free to pick those up and get registered. We look forward to that. Now before we go into our prayer list, I'm going to let Brady say uh, that's the end of it. Thank you for joining us online, and we'll see you next Sunday, I hope.